And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Garnet Schulhauser, an author of five spiritual metaphysical books, a retired lawyer who practiced corporate law for over 30 years, and a level two quantum healing hypnosis technique practitioner. Today we're going to talk about spirit guides, reincarnation, astral traveling, Gaia, and more. Garnet, thank you so much for being my guest today and welcome. Thank you for having me, Jeff. I'm delighted to be here. All right. Um, In your books, you talk about your spirit guide, Albert. Can you tell us a little bit about who you were before you met Albert and how you actually met Albert? Yeah, I was a corporate, as you mentioned in the in, in my bio, I was a corporate lawyer in, in Calgary, Alberta, in Canada. Um, and I was a very typical sort of corporate lawyer who uh, was buttoned down, stuffed shirt kind of a guy, arrogant, condescending, until I met my spirit guide, which changed everything. But I was uh, I was raised as a Roman Catholic, uh, was an altar boy and did all that sort of stuff. Um, and then when I got into my 20s and 30s, I started questioning and then ultimately rejecting a lot of the dogmas of the Catholic Church didn't make any sense to me. So then I was in what I would call no man's land for a number of years where I would constantly ask myself the eternal questions of life, like who am I? Why am I here? What's my life purpose? And the big one, what happens to me when I die? Do I disappear into nothingness or do I continue on? So I was searching for answers. And then, uh, so, so it was one day back in 2007, and I was still practicing corporate law. And I was strutting down the the street in my three-piece Navy suit. Um, And uh, all of a sudden, a homeless man just jumped up in front of me. And I didn't see where he came from, but it's like he suddenly just appeared in front of me. And he looked like a typical homeless man. He had long, stringy hair and a scraggly beard and dirty, slept-in clothes. And I didn't go around him as I usually did when I encountered homeless people on the street because typically they were panhandling for money or whatever. And I didn't have much time for homeless people at that stage in my life. But I didn't go around to this guy because he had these amazing, sparkling, dazzling blue eyes. They, they shone at me like two little blue stars. Um, and I sensed that he knew everything about me. It seemed like his gaze was penetrating deep within my soul. And he knew everything I'd ever said or done in my life, which was strange because we'd never met before. But I didn't feel violated because at the same time, his eyes were sending me this wave, this gush of what I would describe as pure, unconditional love. And it was infusing my whole body with an amazing sense of peace and security and well-being. It was like the best feeling I've ever had in my life. So I stood there like a deer caught in the headlights. And I, and it was almost like a time war. I had no idea how long I was standing there. So, and then he broke the spell by saying to me, why are you here? Then he promptly disappeared into a nearby store. But when I finally collected my wits, I decided I had to go find this guy, find out who he was. So I went into the store where he had gone into. There was only one entrance and exit. He hadn't come out, but he was nowhere in the store. So I walked out on the street and walked up and down for several blocks, hoping to find him. But he had disappeared into thin air. So that night, I resolved that I was going to go back to that street the next day to see if I could find him. So I did. Same street, same time of day. And I started searching for him, going up and down several blocks in each direction. And I was about to give up when I saw him sitting all alone on a bench. So I went up to him and I said, who are you and why did you stop me the other day? And he said, I'm a soul just like you. I'm here to answer your questions and help you on your journey. Then my skeptical lawyer brain kicked in. And, And once you're a lawyer, you can never get rid of that. My skeptical lawyer brain kicked in and said, I said to him, why do you think you can help me when you can't even help yourself? Because it looks like you've been sleeping on the street for weeks and you smell like a dead fish. Well, he just gave me a big smile. And he said, you know, looks can be deceiving. He said, you look like you're a very successful corporate lawyer with everything under control. But we both know that's just a facade. He said, you know what, if you want to, turn around and go back to your office and see if you can find all those answers you've been seeking in all those emails from your clients waiting for you on your computer. Or you can sit down and have a chat with me. 
So luckily my intuition was screaming at me that I really should sit down and, you know, for a while, what did I have to lose half an hour of my day? So I sat down at the bench and we began a dialogue. And I found out early on that he said his name was Albert and he was really one of my spirit guides in disguise. He had manifested himself for me. So we began this dialogue, which is a, basically a Q and A and that went on off and on for several months, not all at once, but you know, here and there. And I found out later that I was the only one who could actually see him in physical form. I could not only see him, but I could touch him. He felt real. And, and I reached out and grabbed the shoulder and, and he said that no one else could see or touch him. And so if somebody had been walking down uh, the street past that bench that day, they would have seen me talking to myself because they can see Howard. In any event, so they, he manifested physically for the first three times. And then after that, we communicated by telepathy. And he was just a voice in my head. Um, and when I asked him why he appeared to me the first few times as a homeless man, he said it was his way of uh, gently introducing me to the conversation. Because if he had suddenly, out of the blue, started talking to me as a voice in my head, I likely would have thought I was losing my mind. And he was probably right. So then after, when he no longer manifested, I, I recognized his voice. I knew who he was. I was comfortable talking to him. So that's how, um, that's how I first met him. And he told me early on, he said, I'm not just here to satisfy your curiosity. I want you to write a book about what I revealed to you so others will have access to my revelations which took me aback a bit because I'd never even dreamed of writing a book, but in, in any event. Um, so about a year after um, I met Albert, I retired from law just because law seemed so irrelevant to me after speaking with Albert. Uh, and then he prevailed upon me and as, as reluctant as I was at first, I gradually started writing the manuscript for my first book, Dancing on a Stamp. And then when I had finished the manuscript, I, I had some doubts about whether I should get it published because I, you know, what I was saying in my book was was like 180 degrees from what my law partners, former law partners and clients and other colleagues knew me. And I thought a lot of them would think I'd become senile. So I had to struggle with that a bit. And then after a while, I just said, heck with it, let the chips fall where they may. I'm going to publish my book. If I lose some friends, so what? In point of fact, I have lost a few of my former colleagues who don't talk to me. But I gained many, many more new spiritually minded friends. So it's been overall, it's been just a, a very positive change. So after my first book, um, Dancing on a Stamp, uh, Albert disappeared a little while in my life. And then he came back in a very unexpected way. I was sleeping in my bed and, I, and something made me sit up. And I saw this sort of ghost-like ethereal figure standing in the doorway of my bedroom. And when it moved closer to my bed, I could see it was my old friend, Albert. He was an astral for it. And I said, okay, Albert, what brings you here? And he said, well, I'm here to take you on some astral travels, some out of body adventures to the spirit side, to other places on our planet, other places in the universe, because I want you to write about what you see and hear on these travels in your next books. And by the way, you're not finished with one, you're going to write another three or four, which really set me back. But by then I had learned that there's no point in arguing with spirit, they're going to win eventually. So and so then we went off and and, and so my... Last four books were about my astral travels with my spirit guide, Albert, and what I saw, what I heard, who I spoke to. And every one of these is intended to impart some, some nugget of wisdom or, or insight for people who read the books in terms of what's happening to them, where they come from, cycle of reincarnation, and what's going on in our universe. And so it was an amazing adventure, and I'm totally delighted that, that Albert showed up in my life. At any point in the beginning, did you ever doubt what Albert was telling you, and how did you overcome that doubt? Um, I would say I was a little doubtful for maybe the first five minutes of the conversation. It was like, is this guy for real? Is he a, is he a spirit guide? In fact, at that time, I wasn't even sure I knew what a spirit guide was. But in any event, so I had, I had a, a little bit of doubt. But then as he spoke, he spoke with such conviction and sincerity that immediately I just dismissed all those concerns and said, okay, well, I mean, this guy is not making this stuff up. He's for real. And I believe what he says. And so that was very hesitant moment of doubt at the very beginning, but he soon blew that away. And I was right totally on side with him. All right. Albert told you that he's a spirit guide. Did he basically tell you what the function of a spirit guide is? Yes. Every one of us has 
several spirit guides. It could be two, three, five, six, doesn't matter. Everyone's different. Our spirit guides are like our coaches, life coaches on the spirit side. So before we incarnate, we choose our spirit guides from somebody in our soul group or whatever to, to, to sign on to the task of being our guides. And so our guides are with us 24 seven. They're always watching what we're doing. Um, they know what we plan for our lives. So they sort of know, okay, should he go this way or that way? And they're always sending us messages, except that most of the time they're very subtle messages like uh, flashes of intuition, whispers in your mind, coincidental events, gut feelings, that sort of thing. And, and for all too many of us, those messages just get lost in the, in, the, uh, in the throng of thoughts that churn through our heads every day. So a lot of people don't, we're all getting messages. For a lot of people, we don't understand uh, what, where they're coming from or what they're trying to tell us. And so uh, a lot of us really don't tap into this. And in fact, before I met Albert, I was the same way. I mean, I, I mean he, he's been my spirit guide since I was born, uh, but I didn't hear anything he had to say. So basically he had, had to sort of come into my life in a very abrupt manner by manifesting physically and then so that he could talk to me like I'm talking to you now. So very direct Q&A, no misunderstanding. I knew exactly what he was saying. So um, so, so he was he's one of my spirit guides. I have, I have others and, and everyone has their spirit guides there to, to basically provide this coaching. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so it's really comforting to know no one's ever alone. Your spirit guides are always there. You can't see them. And most of the time you can't hear them, but they're always there and they're there to try to help you have the best journey possible that you can on this planet. Do you feel that Albert revealed himself to you physically more because he wanted you to write the books or because your life was so off course that you needed a massive change in direction? Well, I think it was a bit of both, Jeff. Uh, he clearly wanted me to write my books so that his message would get out to everyone. But he also knew that I was struggling. I was, uh, you know, he said uh, that, that it was a facade that I had everything under control. I mean, I was successful financially and, and career-wise, but I just had these doubts about, about uh, you know, all the big questions in life. So he knew I was really struggling with that. So he wanted to help me personally, but really his bigger goal was to get me to write books so that everyone else would have access to what he revealed to me. At some point, I'm pretty sure you came home and told your wife about Albert. How did she respond to that? She was very, very, very uh, uh, positive about it. She's uh, my wife's a very spiritual person, um, and so she had no problem at all with me talking, saying I'm talking to my spirit guide, or telling about my adventures on the spirit side. She already knew all this, and so she was very, uh, very supportive um, all the way through with all my books. And so there was no, I didn't have any conflict at home. She was like, okay, well that's great, and. Gee, I wish I could talk to my spirit guide like you are. And so that was all very good. All right. A lot of my guests are people who describe their near death experiences. What did Albert say happens to people after they die? You mean during a near death experience or when they permanently die? Uh, permanently. Okay. Well, we all came from the spirit side, which some religions call heaven or whatever. And the spirit side is a, is a very wonderful place. There's no pain, suffering, or negative emotions of any kind. There's nothing but unconditional love. That's our true home. That's where we come from. There we're beings of pure energy. Um, and so when our physical bodies die here on earth, our souls go back to the spirit side. That's our true home. So everyone, no matter what you do, no matter who you are, no matter how many wrong turns or mistakes you made in, in your life on earth, when your physical body dies, you go back to the spirit side. Um, and, and, and so that, that's, that's just very comforting. It's, it's, it's like, uh, you, you know, they, contrary to what a lot of religions say, where there's a, a bad place called hell that you will go to if you're a bad boy, Albert says, no, everyone, no matter what you did, go back to the spirit side, because really a life on earth is just, um, uh, it's like a learning adventure for souls. They just souls choose to come incarnate on planet earth, uh, say as a human. Uh, and it's it's to learn and experience things, taste challenges and learn lessons that they need to uh, gain wisdom and uh, grow and evolve their souls. So it's sort of like a learning adventure. And everyone on the spirit side, before they choose a life, they know that they will go back home when their, their physical bodies are are, are, are dead and, and, and they demise. And so it's very much of a, um, it, and it may seem strange to people, but that's all part of the, part of the cycle of reincarnation is that, you know, you, you get to the question of, uh, you know, who am I? Well, we're all eternal beings, all eternal spirits. There's no be 
no beginning, no end. Uh, so we, we go on forever. And, and the reason that we incarnate on in a physical plane like planet Earth uh, is, is just to learn and experience things that will help us grow and evolve. So in answer to the question, you know, why am I here? The answer is because you chose to come. So every, cho every soul has the free choice to come to incarnate or not. Nobody's making a soul incarnate or putting them in a very in a particular life. In fact, every soul, before they incarnate, they prepare what's known as a life plan. So they pick out all the major aspects of their life. They pick out the place, the country they're going to be born or the state. Uh, they pick out the identity of their parents. They choose their name. They choose uh, who their siblings and relatives and other significant people in their life will be. So they, cho they choose that all ahead of time. And they also have other milestones planned in their so, uh, life plan that they want to face, like challenges, and they want to see how they can react to it. Will they grow and evolve? Can they control their negative emotions? That's all part of the adventure. And so having done all that, then they incarnate. The unfortunate part for most people is that we don't remember that we had a life plan, and certainly that not what's in the life plan. So we really don't know. We get here and we're kind of floundering around. For many people, it's asking the same questions that I did, um, and, and that's just all part of the challenge. And uh, so, but, but the good news is, as I said, is that no matter what happens, and even if you stray way off course from your life plan, you're always going to end up back in the spirit side. And when you get back there, you can decide, okay, do I want to incarnate again? If so, where? Or do I want to incarnate on a different planet? Because there's lots of, there's billions of life forms in our universe. You can incarnate somewhere else, you can go back to earth, or you can just stay in the spirit side. It's entirely up to the soul. So nobody makes the soul come here and nobody chooses what kind of life they're going to have when they incarnate. Did Albert talk about near-death experiences at all? Yeah, he did. And, and, and that was in question because, um, as you well know, uh, and I haven't watched all your videos, but I've, uh, but I've watched others, and uh, not everyone's near-death experience is exactly the same. There are some differences. And in fact, some people have had uh, what, what you could only term a hellish experience, although most people have a very nice experience, like going to heaven, meeting their uh, meeting Jesus or Mohammed or Moses or whoever. And so I asked Albert why this was, why there was such a difference. He said that when a person has a near-death experience, their spirit guides design a, a trip, like when they're technically dead, design a trip that, that's for them, to help them uh, change their life or go on a different path uh, in, their, in the remainder of their life. And so that's why they tailor and make it for the person. That they want the person to see what's most likely going to affect their future life in the best way possible. So that's why these are all different because everyone has different places on the journey, different needs, different, they've done different things. So that's why NDEs are, are different. But he says, absolutely. When, when a person has an NDE, their soul does go over to the spirit side and, and they see what they see. And yes, he said, you know, so many of the people who have it uh, say it's so nice over there that they don't really want to go back into their human body, you know? And he says, that's very understandable because it is just an amazingly, good place. But these people are generally uh, uh, gently convinced that they need to finish things back on Earth. And so then they go back. But they when they get back after the NDE, as you well know, uh, they have a much different prospect and outlook on life. And, 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 mo and for most of them, I would assume they have no fear of death after that because they know exactly what will happen when they do die. In some people's opinion, the Earth is the most difficult place to reincarnate to. Has Albert spoke about that at all? Yes, he has. He has said that uh, uh, the Earth school is one of the most difficult in the universe. Very difficult school. And in fact, he has told me many times that any human reading, uh, you know, reading my books and listening to what he has to say, every human should pat themselves on the back for being so courageous as to jump into this very difficult school. So it is a difficult school. It's it's not a not an easy, I mean, if, if you're, as a soul, if you want a sort of an easy life somewhere, there's there's lots of different places you can incarnate where things are not like planet Earth. Uh, but the fact that you're here and I'm here means that I guess our souls decided uh, that we're up for the challenge. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we can do okay on it, but you know, we have to struggle through it. Did he uh, comment on why we choose to come here? Yeah, it, it, it's it, it's to get the uh, it's to sort of perfect our knowledge with hands-on experience. So when you're on the spirit side, you can look at planet Earth. You can see what the humans there are doing and the animals and what's happening, and you can see all that. 
and you can see, you know, crime and conflicts and genocide and wars, and you, and you can sort of understand that there's something driving that, but you don't really know what that's like. And you have to incarnate in a physical form to get hands-on experience. So that when you're in physical form as a human, then you'll have firsthand the experience of, of, you know, fear, anger, hate, greed, violence, and all that sort of stuff. And that's just designed to, to help them perfect their knowledge into wisdom so they can truly understand what, what what's going on on planet Earth with these humans. And it's all part of their evolution to, to, to grow and evolve. Do you think that he feels that humans in general are not doing very well on Earth and that's why he's revealing this information to help us? Oh, absolutely. I mean, he, he has said, uh, and, and other spirits and the spirits that I've spoken to have said, that humanity on planet Earth is at a very crucial crossroads. Uh, like we have... We, we've uh, we've got amazing technology, but our spiritual and emotional intelligence has not kept pace. And so there's still too many of us that are run by our negative emotions, you know, fear, anger, hate, all those bad things. And that's why we have so much conflict and war and crime on, on our planet. And so we are in a really tough spot. He said, you know, we have the, the, the weapons capable of wiping out all life on our planet, you know, nuclear weapons, biological, chemical, whatever. And he said that their their hope on the spirit side is that uh, we won't get to the point where that's going to be unleashed because it could really destroy all life on the planet. And he said, you know, human civilization on our planet has had a, a few other examples of rising up to great heights technologically, uh, but ending up crashing and burning like Lemuria and Atlantis. And there's a number of other ones we don't even know about. And so they're all there on the, on the spirit side, crossing their fingers and trying to do whatever they can to make sure that this particular human civilization, the one that we're in, doesn't also crash and burn. And so we're at a real crucial stage. And so the 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 uh, council of wise ones on the spirit side, they've been recruiting all kinds of advanced souls from other, you know, that have incarnated in other places to come to planet Earth to sort of try to help us over this hump, to get us past this rough patch in the road so that we can uh, learn to embrace love and compassion and forgiveness, get rid of our negative emotions, uh, so that we can have a much happier place to live in. And it's not a done deal. Albert says he's he's optimistic we can do this, but there's a lot of things that can happen in between, and he's just hoping that we will get through this and and and, and not suffer the fate of Atlantis and Lemuria and the other ones. Do you think that Albert is a member of your soul group that just didn't incarnate with you this time? Yes, he is a member of my soul group. He, in fact, told me that he and I have had several physical lives on earth before we were together, like in those incarnations. And so this time it was decided, and I don't know why, that, that he would not incarnate with me, but he would stay behind on the spirit side to be one of my guides. And so, and, and I'm, I'm quite helpful. He's an amazing guide. And what happens in the future, I don't know whether, he, he seems to be fairly advanced. He won't admit to me uh, that he's a master soul. Uh, I think he is, but I think he's probably, my in my own view, and he hasn't confirmed this, my own view is that he's, done with his physical incarnations, and he's going to be helping people from the spirit side. Are you still in contact with Albert today? Yes. Yeah, it's not a, it's not a daily constant thing. It's, uh, it's off and on. Uh, if I have a question, I'll ask him and he'll respond. Sometimes he'll contact me, but it's, it's not. Um, most of my contact, intense contacts were during the periods when he was taking me on astral trips for one of my books. And then after each book, there's sort of a bit of a pause in the action, and then he comes back but he's still in, in, in contact with me, uh, which I very much appreciate. Um, and, um, and, and it just gives me so much comfort. And, you know, every, every, so many of my readers have, have said to me, how can I learn to contact my spirit guide the way you do with Albert? And I just said, well, that's just, I think that's a special one-off. And so the, most of the rest of us have to listen to the subtle messages as opposed to the direct verbal one-on-one -on -one contact. But yeah, he is still around. Are there any uh, ways you can contact them, like through meditation? Yeah, I can. Uh, I, I don't. In fact, when I do try to summon him, I go into a light meditation, and that's how I usually get him. Um, so he, had, no, he has not manifested physically in my life since then, uh, but he does appear in my life in astral form for some of these trips. Uh, and I never know when he's coming. He doesn't tell me his agenda, uh, so I don't know when he's coming. Uh, and he never tells me when he does come where I'm going. It's all a bit of a surprise, but he has an agenda. He's, he has some things that he wants me to see so I can write about. And so I just follow along and um, it's worked quite well. 
All right, since we have the option of not coming back to Earth and going to other realms or other planets, does he mention ETs at all? Oh, yes. Yeah. In fact, uh, he says the, the universe is full of uh, other life forms. There's a, there's a lot of civilizations that are very much more advanced than our human one, uh, like they can travel between the stars and so on. And he says, yeah, the, the, the UFOs that people uh, report seeing, he says, yeah, those are just uh, spacecraft from some of these ET races. Um, and they've chosen right now not to make open and direct contact with humans. But he says at some point in our future, they will when, when they think we're ready to accept that. Um, and in fact, I've, I've visited a couple of the uh, ET races, uh, one of them which was orbiting our planet. Um, basically, uh, what they've said is that there's a number of different advanced races that have been visiting our planet for eons, you know, and they're still around. They're beneficial. They mean us no harm. They're trying to help us, just as the spirits and the spirit side are, help humans become better, have a better life, uh, and, and get over their troubles. And, and But they're not allowed to directly interfere. Uh, you know, I mean, they have the power. They could get rid of all, they could just destroy all of our weapons if they wanted to. They're not allowed to do that. It's It's kind of like star trek's prime directive where you're not allowed to unduly interfere with an inferior race and so they're bound by that kind of a, a directive and so they can help us in subtle ways they can't just sort of hand us the silver bullet on a platter and get rid of all of our our problems i mean they would like to but they're not allowed to do that what about parallel universes has he talked to you about that yeah absolutely and in fact he's taken me on a couple of astral trips to uh, two different ones i mean there's, there's multiple in fact Albert says there's like count, countless parallel universes. And, and 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 what happens is that every time, way back when, when the, the source first created the universe with the Big Bang, uh, the source uh, programmed basically the, the universe is to split into two at random times. So the, there was initially one universe, it split into two, there's two and they kept on splitting. So that creates the parallel universes. And so they can split any time. I mean, as far as we know, our Earth, uh, universe may have split during our lifetimes we don't know people who live there do not know about it but there is earth in a number of parallel universes and so he took me to visit to in one case it was very much uh, earth is very much like um our current earth except for two major differences uh he, he he took me to lower manhattan and and i could see the trade towers still standing and i said to him what year is it and it was our current year and i said well why are the trade towers still standing he said because in that earth, there were no Islamic terrorists. And how that happened was that in the early days, Muhammad, who engendered uh, Islam, as you know, he suffered a, a tragic accident at a very young age. So Islam was never formed. And so there was no, no Islam anywhere, no Islamic extremists. Uh, in the Middle East, um, there was just Palestine that was populated by, uh, by basically Christian Arabs. So most of the people ended up being Christian no Islam. And so that was one of the big changes there. Just by a freak accident, they had no Islam and they had no, obviously no Islamic extre extremists. The other interesting thing is uh, that he took me then from there, he, we went into Harlem and we dropped down on a busy corner. And he said to me, do you notice anything unusual? And I said, well, it's funny, most of the people here are white. And I, and I said, how, how did that happen? This is Harlem. And he said, well, it was another little quirk in the history of that planet where way back in the early uh, 15th century, uh, Britain banned slavery. The rest of Europe also followed Britain. And so there was never any slave trade from Africa to the Americas. Right. Okay, so never any slaves. There was no emancipation proclamation because there were no slaves. There was no civil war, no civil rights movement because they were just treated, I mean, they were treated badly. And so it, the population of African Americans on that planet was like in the U.S. was like one percent through normal immigration, um, as opposed to like thirteen percent in in the current U.S. So, two little quirks in the history made some significant differences. Now the planet wasn't perfect; they still had world wars and all that sort of stuff. But in those two areas, they they were much different than Earth. Then he took me to another parallel universe where um, they also suffered from a pandemic, the COVID pandemic but they suffered it sort of earlier in their stage. They got over that um, and they realized that during the pandemic, there was so much less pollution on their planet. Like, you know, smog, uh, not as much smog over LA and waters were clean and 
So they, in, in realizing this during the lockdowns, they said, well, we've tried to get, we've got to try to get back to that position. So their scientists dug in and got uh, to work and the, and the scientists at the CERN uh, lab in Switzerland, they worked on it and they eventually were able to teleport a molecule of water from one place to another. And from there, it gradually moved up to other things. And so wh when I dropped down into this parallel universe, uh, teleportation for people, goods, freight, everything was was in vogue. And so there was, uh, there was a lot less, hard, well, virtually no trucks or trains on the road carrying cargo. Uh, cargo was transported by teleportation. I mean, like the Star Trek teleporter uh, that we all know. And people, uh, and so nobody needs to fly. So if you're living in LA and you wanted to go to see a friend in New York, you just go into a teleportation booth, punch in your destination, and within seconds you're in New York. And so it was really quite amazing. It's really heartening to know that that, that human scientists, as they put their mind to something, can really achieve great things. And so that world was very much, wasn't totally pollution free, but it was the pollution was way less than our earth. And so that was encouraging. Uh, hopefully our scientists can get there someday, but we really have to work hard at not only stifling our negative emotions, but to stop our pollution of our dear old mother earth. Did he happen to show you, you in the other parallel universes? No, and I asked him, I asked him if I could see if I was in a parallel universe and what I was doing. And he said, no, that would not be good for you at this time. Maybe in the future he will. He, he just didn't, uh, he has his own reasons, but he doesn't always uh, comply with my requests. It, for him, it's sort of like, do I need to know that? Is it useful for me? And if it's not, then he's not going to tell me. So I, I really would have liked to see myself, you know, you know and, and, and so would everyone. I mean, we, we, it, we all probably have clones in other, in other parallel universes, you know. And, and when you go through your life and you look back and, you, and you, you recall a number of major decision points, like should I take the left fork or the right fork in the road uh, for a career or a marriage or whatever, and all of us have probably wondered, I took fork, the left fork, what, what would have happened if I would taken the right fork? And so if you could look into the parallel universes where some of your clones were, you might find out that they took the different fork. And it might be good news because you might be better off than them, or it might be bad news because you took the wrong choice. Yeah. Anyway, to, to just, I haven't been able to see that because he has not let me see myself in a parallel universe. Right. I was thinking the same thing while you said that. But then I was thinking, is there really any good or bad choices? There's just choices and we're here to learn experiences. Well, you know, you're quite right. When I, when I say good and bad, I mean relative to the human consciousness because we know th some things are good for us, some things are bad. You're right. In the absolute sense, there is no right or wrong or good or bad. It just is what it is. And everything that you, every choice you make is, uh, it, it, it impacts on sort of your, your journey and your wisdom and your evolution and so on. But there are no absolute bad choices. And, 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 you know, and you'll see that when you're on the spirit side is that it's, it's all a learning experience. And so, no, you're right. There are no absolute right or wrongs, but humans tend to place those relative terms on, on what happens to them. Yeah. And plus if he showed you, a decision in another universe that you are, you know, more successful or more happy than this universe, it may really mess you up in this universe. Like, wow, I should have made that decision 20 years ago. And now look what I've done. I've totally wrecked my life or whatever. Exactly. And that's exactly why uh, he doesn't want to, me or anyone else to see that because it could either make you very happy or make you very sad and depressed and spend the rest of your life beating yourself up for making the wrong decision. So, uh, it, 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 that's the main reason that they don't show us that. Hmm. But you can see all that when you get back to the spirit side. You can see every one of your lives in every parallel universe. What about life reviews? Did you talk about those? Absolutely. That's one of the key things that happens when a soul leaves its physical body on death and, and goes back to spirit side. One of the first things that happens is the soul has a life review, which is basically a review of everything in their last life in as much detail or as you want. And you can, you can look at it as like you're watching a 3D movie and you can watch what's going on. You can pick the places that you want to see. Um, so you can sort of, excuse me, review what you did, you know, the, not just the, the bad things that you did, but the good things as well. And the interesting thing about a life review is that you get to, to uh, hear the thoughts and feel the emotions of anyone you interacted with on earth which we can't do now. So if you inadvertently said something nasty to, to a coworker uh, in, in, in your life on earth, 
you get to feel that person's uh, hurt uh, and, and their sorrow that you were mean to them. And that really hits home because a lot of times we, we, we harm, hurt people uh, unintentionally. We don't really want to do it, but, but just because we're not paying close enough attention. So that's a learning tool. When you, when you see that, you can, uh, you can then sort of better plan your next incarnation if you choose to do that. So life review is very, very important. It's not meant to to uh, to punish a person or make them feel bad about the bad things, because you see bad things and you see good things. You can see the whole picture, um, but it, it's meant as a learning tool. You go over it with your guides, and they give you some counseling, and then you decide, okay, if I want to go back to Earth, you'll probably choose a life where you can uh, perhaps do better and not make as many mistakes as you made in your last life. And so that's sort of a learning tool, like, okay, give me another shot at it. I'm going to try again. And you, can, and you can incarnate as many times as you like. You can do uh, 10 incarnations or 2,000. It's up to you. Did he give you any insight on how to decide, okay, I've had enough of the earth. I'm going somewhere else. No, it, it, it's, up, it, it's up to each soul. And every soul has sort of a different measuring stick in terms of uh, when they think they have graduated from planet earth. So nobody says, yeah, you, you made it or you haven't. Nobody outside of you. So you decide on yourself, I've graduated or I haven't. And, and so and if you graduated from planet Earth, you can then go and incarnate somewhere else. Or for some uh, advanced souls who graduated, they will choose to incarnate back on Earth, not because they need it, but to help other souls. So they'll say, okay, I'm going to help this other soul in my soul group because they really want to go back and they want to try this challenge again. So I'm going to go back to be a character in their life to help them. And so you have the, the two different kinds of incarnations, uh, those to help other souls and those to to learn things. Since you were raised Catholic, did you talk to him about who was Jesus, who was the Virgin Mary, who is God, et cetera? Oh, absolutely. Uh, not only has he spoken to me about it, but I did have conversations with those people on the spirit side. So Jesus was clearly, he was incarnated as a human. He was a master soul. He came to earth voluntarily because he felt at that time that humanity needed a basically a kick in the pants to get them moving up the spiritual ladder. So he incarnated for that purpose. He was a master, so that he was able to use his focus, his thoughts to manipulate matter and energy. That's why you know the, the, the miracles described to him in the Bible, walking on water and turning water into wine and so on. He actually did that because he could just focus his thoughts to do that. Those are the kinds of things that everyone on the spirit side could do. But when you're here as a human, you forget how to use all the brain power that you have, and you end up where we are, where we can't do any of that stuff. But he. And he, and he did, he, he had insights. He was allowed to remember who he, who he was or where he came from. And he knew what was going to happen to him. He wanted to impart his story. And he knew that um, uh, he was going to be crucified. He could have stopped that, but he thought that being crucified and then rising up would be a, a great message, a great send-off for his, his new religion, which he knew would develop. And so he, he was very much a real person. And his mother Mary... Um, for, for Catholics, they won't hear this, but it wasn't an immaculate conception. It wasn't a virgin birth. She said that she had sexual relations with her husband, Joseph, that resulted in Jesus, and she had other children, uh, which is contrary to, to, to what the Christian dogmas say, but that's that's the reality of it. So, so they're very wise and compassionate souls. Um, you may think, how could somebody as uh, famous and as uh, popular as Jesus, how could he have time to talk to me well, anyone can talk to him because you know time just doesn't linear time doesn't exist on the spirit side. So there's, you never run out of time. You have all the time in the world, so to speak. And so anyone can go and, and, and talk to Jesus or Mary, uh, Mary Magdalene. Jesus was actually married to Mary Magdalene. She's a very nice soul. Uh, she lamented the fact that uh, some Christian historians tried to describe her as a as a prostitute, a harlot. She said, "Couldn't be further from the truth." Never wasn't even close to that. Uh, and she uh, worshiped Jesus, married him. They had three children. And and uh, what happened was that the, the early Christian scholars decided that that wasn't a good story to have. The best story was Jesus was uh, never married. He was a God. Mary was a, a virgin all her life. So they wrote out anything to the contrary in the early gospels, tell their story the way they wanted it to tell in terms of the Catholic church. So I'm sure a lot of Catholics and, and, and Christians would be unhappy about that, but that's what he told me. And that's what I heard directly from them. And so I, have, I certainly believe that. 
What did he tell you about God? Well, God is the source. The source is sort of the sum total of everything in the universe. Um, the source created everything um, and uh, created the universe, created all the life forms. But unlike the, the sort of the Christian belief about a God who's like an old man sitting in a gold throne in the sky, uh, you know, pulling strings and making things happen, source does not interfere with what happens on Earth, doesn't pull strings, uh, doesn't make things happen or not happen. Source just sort of is content to sit back and watch what, uh, what unfolds, watch what his its, its creations have done, what they're doing, and, and lives sort of uh, through, through every one of us. Every one of us is connected to the source intimately, and we're connected to each other. So we're all part of the whole scheme. Um, but the source is not the sort of the God that a lot of Christians depict, which is good because it means that uh, the source doesn't make rules for us to follow. You know, the churches always say, here's a bunch of rules you have to follow. Uh, they came from God, but they didn't really. They came from men. And if you don't follow these, you're going to go to hell. That was sort of the, the dogmas when I was growing up. I think a lot of them still believe that. The fact of the matter is, as you mentioned earlier, Jeff, according to the source, there's nothing right or wrong or good or bad in an absolute sense. It just is what it is. You said that we're all interconnected. Would you say that we're all the same or one? Well, I, we're not sort of one in the sense that, that we all have individual aspects, individual personalities. So the best way to describe it is, is that we are individual aspects of the source. And so we all have differences. <clears throat> We've all been on different journeys. We've all spun out from the source, you know, at different times to start our journeys. And that would make, that's what makes life interesting. I mean, if we were all identical clones who said and thought and did things exactly, it would be pretty boring. I mean, what's the point? You know, why would you incarnate? Uh, you know, so, so we all are different. And when we when we die, we retain our personalities to some degree so that, you know, it's it's like you have your experiences on your journeys. I have mine on mine. Um, we don't retain anything negative, so we don't have any negative emotions or any uh, hatred or any thoughts for revenge. But we all have our own unique personalities and we all have our unique energy signature so that anyone on the spirit side can immediately identify another soul by their energy signature. And so, uh, it, it, and, and even though souls can choose to appear in different forms when, uh, when they're on a spirit side, basically everyone recognizes who they are. And there's nothing but absolute transparency on the spirit side. You can't lie. You can't try to deceive. Everyone can see right through. And not that you'd want to try, but everyone can see exactly who you are, where you've been, what you've done. So you can't sort of pretend that you weren't a bad guy in a past life or one of your lives because everyone knows, well, we know what you did. So it's very transparent, very loving, um, and just a wonderful place. It'd be really nice if we could have some of that on planet Earth, but we've got a long ways to go. In your books, you describe conversations you've had with Gaia, the consciousness of Mother Earth. What message did she leave you with? Well, she's a very kind and benevolent uh, spirit entity. She's really the consciousness of our planet. And she loves all of her flora and fauna with, with a great passion. So she loves all, all of her animals, including humans. The message she left for me is that she's very distressed at how humans have been polluting Mother Earth over the last few hundred years. It really picked up after the Industrial Revolution when humans could really step up the pollution. And, and so pollution is bad. It, it, it harms uh, the, her physical environment. It's bad for her other animals. She loves her other creatures just like she loves humans. So she, her message was, humans, you've got to change your way. You've got to curtail your pollution. And there is efforts to do that. She recognized but we're not getting there fast enough. We have to curtail our pollution. Otherwise, it's going to play out really badly on us. And you know, uh, recently, the, all the talk about climate change, uh, and you've probably noticed that natural disasters in our planet have really picked up in numbers and intensity, earthquakes, floods, wildfires, volcanoes, whatever. That's just all part of, uh, of Mother Earth's reaction to, to the pollution. And, and Mother Earth is trying to give us a warning, a, a warning shot across our bow that we have to change our ways or we're gonna end, it's gonna end up badly. Like we're gonna end up you know, through our pollution if we don't curtail it, we're gonna end up with severe climate changes severe weather patterns, and it's going to hurt a lot of us. And so that was your message. Like humans, get your act together and stop the pollution and stop abusing my other animals. Did Albert give you any visions of the future? And if so, 
What have you seen? No, he wouldn't give me that. Uh, he he said that he, you know, he can see into the future. He, he said that he he's not going to tell me that uh, for two reasons. If he said that our future was rosy, we had nothing to worry about, then people would relax and, and stop trying to be better. And if he said, you guys are doomed, you're a total disaster, then we'd also give up. And so what he's saying is, you're in a, in a, in a tough spot, but um, he's optimistic that we can pull together and do it, but he's not going to tell me it's a done deal. So we have to just work at it person by person, step by step, try to make our society and our world a better place to live. Since we plan our lives, do we plan our deaths? Yes. Uh, yeah, you do. In, in everyone's life plan, uh, they uh, a soul will incorporate five or six what I call exit points where they can they can leave. And then as they go through life, uh, when an exit point comes up, they can decide or your soul can decide, do I want to exit now or do I want to keep going? And so then if you pass another exit point, you can keep on going on to the next one. And in fact... No one dies by accident because the soul decides to uh, exit when they're ready to exit. So that even if you see uh, 300 people killed in an airplane crash, it wasn't an accident because every one of those souls decided that that was the time and place to exit the incarnation. So that may seem strange to people, but our souls get to decide when we leave. And if somebody dies from, if, if the soul is ready to leave, and uh, uh, the, 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 in some cases they may just say, okay, well, we'll trigger cancer and that's how you'll die other cases that might be an accident a heart attack whatever your soul has many different ways of orchestrating the human physical demise and they do so when they're ready and they're ready is sort of like okay i've learned everything i'm going to learn in this life uh, so i'm going to go back to the spirit side um, but your soul gets to decide where is the soul making that decision on the other side generally yes because because every night when people sleep their souls temporarily leave their bodies and travel on the astral plane uh, to the spirit side. And there they will huddle with their spirit guides, sort of do a checklist like, okay, how am I doing compared to my my life plan? Uh, they'll get advice from the spirit guides. And it's at that stage where they can say, okay, I'm going to trigger uh, a demise of my physical body because I've had enough of this. Either I'm frustrated or I've done, you know, ticked off all the boxes and I'm ready to move on. So that's where your soul decides. Unfortunately, your human mind is not privy to those conversations, so you don't know what your soul is planning for you. And so the natural human animal reaction is, I, I don't want to die, I want to live as long as possible, so that's our human reaction, but your soul is the mastermind, the orchestrator of when you actually die. Did you ever talk to Albert about humans in general? And what I mean is, are we a product of evolution, or were we genetically manipulated by some other being? We were, he, he has told me that we have been seeded on this planet from, by ETs, uh, you know, the, because they have the travel between the stars. So they, we were seeded here from other planets um, and, uh, and, and basically, and more than once, because sometimes on the early stages, the human civilization was just wiped out by natural disasters or whatever. So there's been a number of, of different seedings. Uh, so we really originated from the stars. Uh, and, and, and that's, and, and, and in fact, in my books, I've, uh, I describe visits to two different human civilizations on other planets that are uh, way more advanced than ours, and in some cases, substantially different in terms of their societal outlook and how they run their business. So I have, I have actually seen other human civilizations. All right. We keep talking about your books, but we haven't you know, even given anybody the titles. So can you tell us the titles of your books and where to find them? Okay. okay. Absolutely. Um, I'll do it in order of publication. The first one is Dancing on a Stamp, and then Dancing Forever with Spirit, and then Dance of Eternal or uh, Heavenly Bliss, and then Dance of Eternal Rapture. The last one is Dancing with Angels in Heaven. Okay. Um, all the books are available on all of the online bookstores. Um, some of the bricks and mortar stores have them. Um, you can go to my website, which is garnetschulhauser.com. Um, if that's too hard to remember, if you Google my name or any of my book titles, you can get to my website. On my website, I have convenient buy links to Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and all those sites. You just click on that and you get right to the page where you can buy my books. Um, on my website, there's uh, descriptions of my books. There's uh, excerpts, book videos. Um, my website also has uh, links to all my social media platforms like YouTube and Facebook, Instagram, and so on. Um, and 
I also have a, a, a section there where all of my radio shows, all the recordings of my radio shows are there. You can access them right back from my first one in, I think it was 2013. And this, this is radio show 171 for me. So you can access all of the shows there. Um, and if people have any comments or questions, uh, my email address is there on my website. I'd be happy to hear from them. I'm glad that you mentioned your YouTube channel because I wanted to ask you about that. What is the name of it and what kind of content are you producing there? Well, it's, it's, it's named after it's, uh, it's G. Schuhalzer, my YouTube channel. Um, and what I do is I post on there, I post my, uh, my radio show interviews. I post uh, some videos I make about the QH, my QHHT episodes. Um, I post uh, uh, videos of my conference presentations, uh, post my big vid- book videos there. So there's a lot of information there for people that can dial in and, and listen to whatever they want to. Um, and, and so it's a, it's a good source of if people want to get to know me better, go into my YouTube channel and there I am. Are you currently still practicing QHHT? Yes. Yes, I am. Although it's, it's, it's a bit of a, I was on hiatus for the longest time during the lockdown because QHHT is in person. You're sitting in the same, in a closed room with somebody for four or five hours. Um, and so, um, basically I, I put it on hold and now I've opened it up to fully vaccinated people. Um, but it's just slow. People are still so concerned about COVID and Omicron and all that. So there hasn't been a lot of activity. But I also do a remote version called Beyond Quantum Healing, which can be done remotely using Zoom. And I've been doing a number of those. And obviously, there's no danger of spreading uh, COVID uh, with a remote session. So that's that's what's happening. The QHHT, uh, I'm sure, will pick up again when people are more comfortable about, about coming to, you know, my place and and sitting with me in person for four or five hours. Can you share with us anything that you've learned through somebody's experience during a QHHT session that you've, that you haven't even learned about with Albert? Yeah. A lot of the stuff in a QHHT session is, uh, is uh, fairly personal. Um, but there is some general stuff that tends to come out. For one thing I was, uh, I was dealing with a, a, a client who, who wanted to know, felt like she was not from planet Earth. And so when we got to the, the, the questioning her higher self, her higher self says, oh, she's from the Palladian constellation. She's a Palladian. Um, and and I said, so and I said to her higher self, uh, so does she know anybody else who's also a Palladian? And the, the higher self says, yes, you are, meaning me, which is the first I heard of that. Albert didn't tell me that. So mm-hmm. I guess I've had incarnations in the Palladian constellation. Not sure what that means, but... Always good to know where you come from. Have you followed up with that with Albert? I have, and he, and he just says, he, he's very short uh, scripted. He just said, yeah, you are. You don't need to know anymore. You'll find out more later. So, oh, wow. Yeah, well, but, but Albert is like that. All right. Well, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? And if so, how can they reach you? Yeah, I'm open to questions and comments. Uh, best way is by email. My address is contact at garnetschulhalzer.com. That's also listed on my website. So if they have a comment or question, send me an email. I do my best to answer them. Sometimes it's a bit slow depending on the volume, but I try to get back to everyone. Well, before we finish, can you leave us with one last positive message? Yeah, Albert has always said to me, he said, don't take life so seriously. He said, life on earth should be treated as an adventure. You're here to learn and experience things, and no matter how many mistakes you make, you never go wrong or become lost. You're always going to end up back on the spirit side. So he said, enjoy your life, learn from it, laugh lots, smile at strangers, and, and just try to have a happier life. So I've always thought that's great advice. I was going to say that's that's a great message. Garnet, thank you so much for being our guest today. I really appreciate you, and I wish you the best. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, all the best to you and the rest of your of your career and your life. Thank you, and likewise. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara Podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the Join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.